Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining in for today's talk and our prayer is today that this talk will encourage you and that God will speak to you through it. And I do want to say you got to subscribe to this YouTube channel right now if you want to see more stuff like this, all the latest content coming out. And also, don't forget, check out our website, myhopecity.cc and connect with us on Facebook by liking our page, Hope City Efton, and joining our Facebook groups. Again, thank you so much for joining us and I can't wait to see how God is going to speak to you through this talk. Hope City, how are we doing today? Everyone doing good? We want to welcome everyone one more time to Church Online. And we are not only Church Online, we are Church in person now. And that is exciting. And as they've already mentioned a couple of times already in our service today, uh, if you want to register to be a part of Church in person, you can do that. We gather on Thursday nights and then again on Sunday mornings. Uh, so ju just be a part of that, either the pre-weekend service or right here on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11. And of course, we do our Wednesday night prayer service as well. Well, all of you that are in the room, how are we doing? Yeah. We're, we're doing good? I, I got to tell you, it's encouraging and exciting for me uh, to not, I, I mean, church online, it's awesome. We're continuing to be church online. But I, I'm thankful that I'm not just in this room uh, with me and a cameraman. And, and so it's good to have some other people joining with us and, and allowing, you know, just, just to be in God's presence together. And so we've seen every weekend just kind of grow and more people come. Uh, and, and the encouraging thing is this, is not only do we have new people join us every week online, uh, but we have new people since we've been allowed to get back in the building. We've had new people in person in the house every weekend that we've been together. How exciting is that? That, that is awesome. And so it, it's just encouraging. And so we're going to dive right into our message here today. And uh, just something that we started to talk about a little bit last week. If you've been following us right along, we started uh, really Father's Day. was kind of our launch into the series that I, I was just feeling to, to share and that we, we're going to look at the next couple weeks as well as last week. Uh, just before we do that, those in the room, maybe those in your home, uh, if you'll just put your hand in your heart, say a quick prayer with me. Very, very simple. God, I'm open. God, I'm ready. Speak to me now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we started last week, and if you weren't here, uh, we looked at Matthew 22, and really as we started this whole idea in this series called Love Your Neighbor. Someone say, Love Your Neighbor. And I know it's weird, those that are in person today, because we're so used to, you know, being in this building and, you know, we... We'd be here and we'd have people crowded right around us, so it'd be easy to just look person beside us, you know, like, oh yeah, we got to love our neighbor. But right now, even our neighbors in person are a little bit distant. But can you look at your neighbor that, that's in the next bubble next to you and, and just say, love your neighbor. L lo love your neighbor. And, and so we started last week, and the premise of our, our series is really in multiple gospels, different accounts, but we read from Matthew 22 last week, and it says this, says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two. So those of you that were in the room last week or those online, we looked at, at these two things, didn't we? And, and who can remember what they were? They were love God, love people. Love God, love people. And so Jesus taught us that out of all the law and everything that's written in the Old Testament, that all of the teaching of Scripture hangs on these two Love God, love people. Now, as we continue our talk and love your neighbor, uh, there's a good chance that probably this, this man of the law, this lawyer, he already kind of had come to that conclusion. Uh, it wasn't that it was just like, wow, really? Uh, the, it was something that he kind of probably most likely knew. As you kind of dive in a little deeper, a lot of them 
understood it. Uh, but the issue was not knowing, but the issue was applying. Uh, how many know there's a difference between knowing something and applying something? Uh, a lot of us can know certain things, but there's a big difference between knowing it and applying it. I know I should not speed down the highway. I do not always apply that knowledge. And sometimes there might be a police just around the corner, and it doesn't turn out quite so good. A lot of times the issue is not just our knowledge, but the issue is our application to that knowledge. We, we really read this story, a different account in Luke. Uh, many believe it was the same account, but, but just Luke writing from his perspective of what transpired in this event. And, and so we see as we, we see this similar you know, story, probably the same situation. We're going to pick it up today, and this is where we want to go in our, our talk. In Luke chapter 10, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? So, so we see here that, that probably he did have the knowledge because Jesus just looks at him, well, what, what, what does it say? What, what's it say about eternal life? And this is what the, the religious person answered. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. The man that knew the law, the lawyer, the religious person in this story, he asked what I believe was an important question. If we look at this subject, love the Lord your God, and then love people, love your neighbor as yourself, the question that probably all of us would have is, well, who is my neighbor? Now, we, we realize as we read the text that this guy, he really wanted to justify himself. He, he wanted to, you know, just, just sort of make sure, yeah, I, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and, and, and I'm really, really good. I'm a religious person. I know all the law, and, and I mean, he was testing Jesus, so, you, you know, I, I want to justify kind of my choices, and, you know, we ended last week talking about choice, and how all of us, you know, every day have choices, and so he wanted to justify his life, because a lot of times that is kind of what we do, isn't it? We, we want to justify our behavior. Is there anyone in the room that you say, ah, there's times I like to justify my behavior. Uh, you, you know, our kids, our, our kid, I, I, we've, I've talked a lot. Maybe it's COVID and I'm home with the kids way more. I don't know. And they weren't in school. And so you're trying to deal with the, you know, two siblings. And, and how many times, you know, do my kids come up or, or I hear them arguing and I'll go down. I'll say, why did you do that? Or what did you say? And what's the response? Well, I did because, or, well, but he did that. And, and wanting to justify, children want to justify their behavior and their actions. And, and so they'll look or point at other people, but it doesn't change as adults, does it? That even as we get older, we often want to justify our actions or our behaviors. 
And when we come to this subject of love your neighbor, we, we like to say, well, I love those people, or I like that person, uh, you know, but, you know, I, I, I'm doing better at loving my neighbor than my neighbor does at loving me. And, and, and so we, we start to try to justify ourselves. Well, this man of the law, he wanted to justify himself, and so he asked the question, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, to give you a little context of culture at the time, for, for the Jewish people, if you were really to look at, at kind of just the, you know, really the, the social structure at the time in, in that culture, for a Jew, really at the, the hierarchy of it, in the very center, if you were to have kind of a circle, it would be the priest. I, I mean, the, the priest was the top, that I mean, everyone, you know, all the Jews, they looked up to the priests, they honored the priests, and, and then right under that, they would have the, the Levites, and then after that, they would basically have your, the, you know, the, the Jews, just the, the average citizen, and, and basically outside of that, you then would have the, the tax collectors, and, and some of them, and then way out on the outskirts, you would have the Samaritans, and then eventually you'd have the, the Gentiles. And so it's interesting because he asks the question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus ends up telling him a story. I don't know if Jesus told the story just to tell him a story. I, I don't know if it was maybe a story that happened. I, I have wondered as I've even dove into this, getting ready for this series again, that you know maybe, maybe this man was involved in this story. Maybe it was sort of a first account that Jesus was reminding him about an event that he was even a part of because it was calm in the road that Jesus started to talk to him about. It was known to be a place where a lot of robbery would, would happen, that, that thieves would, would basically hide out. It was rocky and it, it was down a hill. And, and so basically a, truly a place where criminals would hang out. And so Jesus starts to tell him this story and, and, and a story that... I believe that probably this guy knew, if not firsthand, he'd heard this story probably secondhand. I, I don't even think this is necessarily a parable. But nonetheless, Jesus starts to answer his question and, and basically tells the story. But I want us tonight, and we're going to get into it next week, but I, I want us today to, to just really look at this. Who is my neighbor? Everyone in the room say, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor. If we're to love the Lord and we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, who is our neighbor? Well, the, the first group of people that I believe is our neighbor are the people that's closest to us. This isn't some big, in-depth, you know, theological discovery. Our, our neighbors are, are those that are closest to us. That our neighbors are literally our neighbors. <laughs> like those that you live close to, those that, that are next to you, those in, in your neighborhood. Uh, they're, they're people that are right across the street or right next door. That, that your neighbor doesn't have to be, you know, well, I've got to really figure this out. No, you, you can be a good neighbor. You can love your neighbor, your actual neighbor. Uh, often in our culture, our physical neighbors, they, they're those that would have the similar social status as, as us or even similar interests, uh, e even sometimes similar life stages, don't they? I know even in my neighborhood, I, you know, it seems that a lot of people that are moving into the, the neighborhood are, are people around my age with, with children and kids, and, and I've got to meet some of the other neighbors that are a lot older than me. They have grown kids. They have grown grandchildren. And it's like there's a shift, and they were telling me the other day, they said, we, we don't even recognize anyone in our neighborhood now because it's all shifted, that everyone our age has, has moved out or moved to retirement homes or this or that, and, and all these young families are moving in. And, and very often that is the case, that our neighbors are, are those that are very close to us, not just physically, but socially. I, I've said this a lot before, that our culture, we live in sort of the garage culture, don't we? Uh, it's an interesting time to live. We, we have a hard time having one-on-one -on -one conversations. We drive into our garage. We, you know, we open the garage door, pull our car in, we close the garage door. We don't even really have to communicate with our neighbors. 
But then we get on social media and we're, we're communicating with everyone else except our neighbors. But your neighbor can be those that are closest to you. As believers, we sometimes can be so connected to loving people through the church that we forget to love our literal neighbors. I'll say that again because this is for someone. Sometimes as believers, we can just become so connected to loving people through the local church that we forget to love our literal neighbors. I, I work with people all the time. I'm always with people, talking to people, and that's something I have to work on because I, I see people that are in the room, I'm online talking to all of you, and, and that's basically my life. And sometimes I find myself guilty of, I, I don't want to see anyone right now. Like, I do want to just drive in my garage, I want to go in my house and, and just not see anyone. And, and, and I, I found that just lately I've been saying, man, I need to do a better job at, at being a, a good neighbor to those that actually live around me. And the other day I felt bad, I was walking my dog and, and I, I'm going, I, I had a couple of kids with me, uh, one of my kids and I think maybe my niece. And so I'm going and, and then a neighbor that I'd never met, he, he was coming out of his house, coming towards me. And this is why I felt bad because someone from our, our church, our local congregation pulls up and, and they were coming down the road and they see us so they stop. And I know I was so distracted and I, I had a conversation with the people from our church, but I was just so in tune right in that moment. I was like, I've never met this neighbor. And I want to go meet this neighbor. And so I had a quick chat with the people from our church. But the, in the back of my mind the whole time, I was just thinking, I don't want this neighbor to go in his house. I, I don't want to miss this opportunity to just go across the street and talk to my neighbor. Who is your neighbor? But Jesus takes it a lot deeper doesn't he, than just your physical neighbor. Jesus takes it a lot deeper than just those that you're closest with. He looks at the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. They're, they're on their way down the road. Before we go too deep into it, it what I find just, I, I believe, is something we need to recognize that our neighbor is simply those that we come in contact with when we're going down the road. That every day of your life, you have an opportunity to love your neighbor. And every day that you live, as you're just going about your day, or you're going to work, or you're going to the grocery store, every person that you come in contact with, they ha are potentially your neighbor. Uh, we... Uh, even uh, online, you, you heard the, the song, you know, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood uh, at the start of the message. And I just, I, I know a lot of our audience, you're like, who's Mr. Rogers? And, and that's way before, way before your time. But those that are old enough to remember uh, Mr. Rogers, the, the show, and, and, and just he, he had a line in the song. And, and the line in the song was simply this, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my, those that are old enough, neighbor? There was this mentality even in this little TV show that it wasn't just those in the neighborhood, although the show was called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, it was, it was basically the, the, this outreach of, of sort of everyone that you come in contact with has potential to be your neighbor. My question to you today is, are you loving your neighbor? I, I believe today that everyone is going to be challenged in one way or another. Maybe just God will speak to you that you need to be a better neighbor to those that live right next to you. But maybe it's just as you're going through life that you've just become so busy. And I, I love this season of COVID where a lot of us have been able to refocus and look at things differently. And and maybe some of us have been so busy going through life that we miss opportunity over and over to love our neighbor. People we come in contact with. At Tim Hortons, at the restaurant, at the mall, where, wherever we might be, love your neighbor. But then Jesus goes farther. And I believe your neighbor, as you read this story and read the words of Jesus, our neighbor are those that are in need. 
those that are in need. Each and every day we will meet people that have needs. And I believe that Jesus is looking at, at this man of the law and he starts to talk to him. And I, I believe Jesus was taking him on a little journey. You know, he thought he was testing Jesus. And, and, and I, I believe Jesus knew his motives and his heart. And so Jesus kind of, how do you learn eternal life? Well, let, let, let's walk through this a little bit. Let's walk through this a little bit. You know you're to love the Lord, you're to love God, you know you're to love people, but you want to know who your neighbor is? Well, here's a story about a man who was beaten, robbed, stripped, left for dead. And the religious people, the people that knew the law, the priests, the Levites, they're coming down the road. Now, when, when you look at it a little bit deeper, it, it, it would be really signifying that probably they, they were leaving the, the temple, that they had just done their religious duties. They, they had just done sort of what was required of them. And, and so in their minds, they had just finished loving God. And aren't we guilty of that sometimes? I, I went to church. I, I'm not ready to go in person, but I at least went to church online. And, and so I did my loving God thing. And, and I believe Jesus was, was pointing something out that, that these religious people, the priest and the Levite, those that, that knew that, that the, the law hangs on these two things, love God, love people, they did the love God thing, so they thought. And then all of a sudden they come up to a person in need. A chance to truly love God in the flesh. And what do they do? They go to the other side. And they keep on going. Any religious exercise that hinders you from helping those in need. Is not true Christianity. Any religious exercise that hinders you. Helping those in need is not true Christianity, and it's definitely not being like Jesus. Jesus taught us in Matthew 25, he said these words, he said, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. A couple of verses down... They didn't understand, you know, when, when did we see you like this? And he said, I tell you, whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. You want to love God? You've got to love people. The evidence of how much you truly are loving God is how much you are truly loving people. The greatest command, love the Lord your God. The second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who is my neighbor? Yeah, those closest to you, those you come in contact with. But way beyond that, it's people in need. Every day of your life, you're going to come in contact with people in need. The last one is this. I believe the, the answer to the question, who, who is our neighbor? Yes, it's those closest to us and those we come in contact with, those in need. It's also people who are farthest from you. People that are farthest from you. And I'm not talking right now that, oh, so you mean, you know, foreign missions and people from other parts of the world. I I'm talking people that are still right in your community, but they're maybe far from you. Jesus, as he tells this story, he starts with the priest, the Levite. The next in line in the hierarchy or in the social status in the minds of the Jewish people would have just been a regular Jewish person. But Jesus skips over that person, doesn't he? Well, then the next would be the, the tax collectors, the, the, even sinners. But Jesus didn't even go there. Jesus jumps all the way and says, then a Samaritan. 
Now you have to understand for, for these Jewish people at the time, especially those of the law, that the relationship that between the, this, the, these people, between the Jews and the Samaritans was not good. The, the Jews considered the Samaritans to be at best second class. They, they were a mixed race and, and, and they had a, a long history. They were different culturally and def, definitely ethnically, socially, everything else. But Jesus deliberately looks at the man of the law when he asks the question, who is my neighbor? And he goes to the Samaritan. You see, your neighbor is those that are farthest from you. I want you to know today, and and I believe we know it as Hope City, but if you don't, if you're joining us online, you need to understand this, that God created every man and woman equal. God created mankind equal. That he doesn't look at us and say, well, this person, you grew up here, you grew up there, and and, and you have different, no, it it is all the same in the eyes of God. Do you know what the Bible does tell us? Do you know what the Bible tells you? Because we we find ourselves in this place and and culturally you look at it right now and we we see this tension, especially racial tension, don't we? This racial tension that that is in the world today. But do you know what the Bible tells us? It, It says in James, it says, if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. It's that simple. That, that there, there is no favoritism. That, 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 that we're all equal in the eyes of God. God created us all the same. Galatians tells us this. It says, and, and just believing it, as believers, it says there's no longer Jew or Gentile. That, that's going even farther than Samaritans. There's not Jew or Gentile. That, that's going all the way out in, in, in the social status. There's not slave or free. There's not male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. I I love, I love having church in person. I love church online. Uh, We have enjoyed it and we're going to continue to do church online. There are hundreds of you that are joining us every week. Many of you coming to faith in Christ and, and I love it. But you know something, when we finally step into eternity, it's not going to be church online. It's not. It's not going to be church online. Those of you that don't like people, sorry. There's going to be a lot of people in heaven. There's going to be a lot of us, and we're going to be worshiping and praising God. and It's going to be a huge, huge party. But this is what John the Revelator wrote as he, he saw in a vision of what it would be like in eternity. He said, after this I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. They were shouting with a great roar. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Those that may be farthest from us different than us, a different neighborhood, a different background, a different social status. That's your neighbor. But even deeper than that, what Jesus was saying is your neighbor is even your enemy. You see, the Samaritans and the Jews have been in conflict for generations. Generations of fighting history of hating. Josephus, he, he tells us, a historian, that basically, I mean, you, you look through it, that the Samaritans would harass the Jewish pilgrims as they would travel through Samaria. And, and then we see the Samaritans, they'd scatter even human bones on the Jerusalem sanctuary. He says that the Jews, in turn, they'd go and burn down Samaritan villages. As a culture, Samaritans and Jews were enemies. You talk about being far from someone, your enemy. The interesting thing is the law that they were looking at and the the two most important things 
love your neighbor comes from Leviticus. And do you want to know the context of what it says in Leviticus? Because we can love our neighbors in our neighborhood. We have a lot in common with them. All right, those we come in contact with through the day, through our week, okay, we can love them. We see needs, it, even as humans, hopefully as we see needs, there, there's something stirs in our heart, but when you're talking about loving those that are farthest from you, those that you would even consider your enemies, that, that's pretty tough. But if you go all the way back in Leviticus, this is the context of love your neighbor. It says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. Romans says this, it says, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their head. Love your neighbor. Next week, we're going to look at this. Because in responding to the question of who is my neighbor... Jesus didn't just come out and say who, he really responded with how. It's not about who, it's, it's how. The only who, really, as you start to look at it, possibly the neighboring person was a Samaritan, the one that did good. But I've got a feeling that Jesus was going way deeper as he told this story. Because you've got to remember the context. The man of the law asked the question, how do I have eternal life? Now, on the outside, you would look at it and you would say, well, it's still all about works, even as Jesus tells the story. Love God, love people. But if you're here today and you are a believer, we know that Jesus taught us that the only way to truly have eternal life is through him. Oh, yes, faith and works go hand in hand. They... They are the same. You, you can't have faith without works. So you would look at this story and one might think, well, was Jesus basically saying there's another way to earn eternal life outside of the grace of God? I told you at the first that I got a feeling that this man of the law knew this story possibly firsthand. Maybe he was with the priest walking down the road. Maybe he was with the Levite walking down the road. Or maybe he was the very one that had been beaten and been robbed and been left for dead. Because he asked the question to Jesus, he said, who is my neighbor? And Jesus ended by saying, who was the neighbor too? Who showed himself to be the neighbor? And it was the Samaritan. Which would make me think that when he's saying, who is my neighbor? Jesus is saying, do you know who you are, man of the law? You're the person who was in the ditch. And the Samaritan showed himself to be a neighbor. 
What you need to understand as you read Scripture, you'll see that the people of the law, the religious people, one of the things that they said about Jesus, do you know what they called him? You read it in John 8, 48. They called Jesus a Samaritan. They said, oh, we're, we're right in saying that you're a Samaritan. I believe that Jesus was painting a picture. Yeah, you love the Lord your God. You love your neighbor as yourself. But how many know that the enemy of our soul seeks to steal, kill, and destroy? And some of you in your life, you have found yourself, and you don't know how to explain it, but it's as though life has beat you up and you are left in a ditch. And, and I believe that the behind the scenes that Jesus was telling a story that, guess what, the Samaritan comes along. We're going to go deeper next week into this story. But the Samaritan picks him up out of the ditch. That's what Jesus wants to do for you. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I've come to give you life. I'm going to ask for those that are in the room to stand with me. Don't, don't miss next week. We're, this is just a, an in-between. We're, we're going somewhere with, with this story. But right now, if you're in this room, or you're in your living room, or your kitchen, where, wherever you might be. We're one church in many rooms today. But if you're here or you're there and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, and maybe today you feel as though life has left you beaten, life has left you hurt, life has left you scarred, life has left you in a ditch. I, I want you to know that, that Jesus loves you. And Jesus is greater than the good Samaritan that he talked about. Jesus wants to come in and pick you up. He, he wants to wash you clean. He, he wants to break every bit of bondage. He wants to break every chain in your life. He wants to set you free. So if that's you today, say, I need Jesus. I, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I want to pray with you. I'm going to ask those in this room if you'd close your eyes. and That's you that you say, I, I, I want to pray today and ask Jesus into my heart. If you just raise your hand, those that are joining us online, you, you don't have to let us know, but you can even right now just say a message, say, I, I need Jesus. There's a hun hundreds of people right now online with you, and they want to pray with you. If that's you, we're going to pray this prayer. I'm going to ask the whole church to just join with me. Say these words, dear Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you came to this world to be my Savior. And so Jesus, today, I ask you to come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope today's talk was encouraging to you. And hey, we would love to hear from you of how God spoke to you through this talk. And again, you can message us on Facebook. Make sure to like and follow us while you're there. Hope City F10. You can reach out on our website, myhopecity.cc. And don't forget, subscribe to this YouTube channel so you can stay up to date with all the content coming out. And we are excited to see how God is going to continually move through your life through this. Love you guys. Have a great day.